Well, today I'm super excited because I get to talk with Amy Palangian, who runs a website and an Instagram page and has books about toddler eating. And so her website is yummytoddlerfood.com. Her Instagram handle is yummytoddlerfood. And she has a really active presence online talking to parents about how to get their kids to eat, because that is something that I hear just all day long in the office is, my toddler won't eat. He eats great at daycare. Um, she only likes chicken nuggets. She won't eat anything else. They, all they do is drink milk. And so it's a very, very common question, concern that I hear all the time in my practice. And it's always great to get more advice and more suggestions and those very specific recipes and advice and strategies. And, and sometimes just like reaffirmation that there's other people that are struggling to get their toddlers to eat too because I think people feel very much alone or that you know my friends are all posting pictures of their kids eating raw broccoli and why doesn't my kid do that Um, and so I'm excited to get to talk to Amy today. And Amy, if you could just introduce yourself a little bit and tell us, tell our, my listeners how you got to the place that you're at now doing everything that you do with Yummy Toddler Food. Sure. So thank you for having me on. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I worked in magazines for about a decade and I worked um, as a lifestyle editor, as a recipe developer, as a food editor doing crafts and um, so the magazine industry is not what it once was. And so right. the jobs I had kept going away. And so I was really looking for a way to um, have something that I didn't need to worry quite about um, as far as just employment goes. Sure. So that, was, that was one aspect of how this all started. And then, okay. but really, so when my first daughter was born, like, we did baby led weaning. There were rules right. to follow. I right. understood how that worked. And then she turned one and I felt like the rules changed, but nobody told me what they were. And that is so common. I hear that all the time. Yeah. And she, she couldn't eat the same foods as us all of the time because, mm -hmm. you know, little kids can't chew things that are complicated textures or sticky or, and I didn't want her to have a ton of sugar or added salt. Right. Right. And all of like the quote unquote kid food was like for older kids. And so I just felt like there was this huge gap of like, what am I supposed to feed my one year old? And then right. through, like two and three. And then combined with that, kids at that age start having opinions and they <laughs> not want just a little bit. Yeah. Which you've given them. <laughs> and it's like, it really throws like it's emotional. It's ch oh, yeah. really challenging. Um, and so the website started as a place for me, as for like a lot of bloggers, it sort of started as a hobby. Um, mm -hmm. And then I started connecting with people and realizing like, this is something that a lot, probably like every toddler parent, <laughs> right? Like almost every toddler parent struggles with is just, right. what do I make for my kids? How do I know if it's healthy? How do I get them to eat it? And like, what's the deal with family meals? So, right. Yeah. So what does that actually look like, is that even a possibility? Is it like you saw on TV in the 1950s? Right. Um, and will I want to eat it myself? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so that sort of is how it all happened. And um, so I now have three kids. I've been through the toddler phase twice. I'm like at the tail end of it with my second one. Oh, and perfect. Yeah. So it's, it's been definitely a learning a learning experience going through it and also just talking with lots and lots of other parents. And so I approach the site as like a resource for parents looking for healthy, totally doable recipes. Right. If you're super busy, but also that maybe have a little bit higher chance of the kids actually eating them because I do come to it from a lens of like your kid will be able to chew this. Right. The flavors are not crazy, but it's flavorful. So it's interesting. Right. Um, so that's, that's sort of where I'm coming from. I like that. And I like your, the thing about yummy toddler food that I, your website that I like is like, it's very action oriented, like do this rather than like theories. It's very much like, here's all the stuff that a six month old could eat that are finger foods or purees or those sorts of things. And then here's other things to try. And there's just 
huge list of different things because I think parents get stuck often mm -hmm. and don't know, okay, they did okay with that. Can we try this? Or what are some other variations that will give them a nice varied diet over time? Right. Um, you've gone through this. You talk with lots of parents that are in the trenches. What is, what is the most common misconception about like that, that phase that you just described where you go from an 11 month old to a 13 month old and all of a sudden all the rules have changed. What are some of the common misconceptions that you hear from parents and how do you address those? Um, so a really big one is when like 13, 14, 16 months, my, my kid is just not eating. Like they're, right. they don't seem, they don't seem hungry they seem like they're getting picky. And what a lot of people don't realize is that toddlers don't always grow as fast as babies and they don't always sure. eat as much as babies. But if you don't know that, then you, it just seems like your child is suddenly not eating and right. they're not eating enough. And, and then you start to like spiral a little bit, a little bit about how to get them to eat. So I am like regularly trying to remind people that if you have a one-year-old who is not eating as much as they used to, it is unless there's like an underlying medical issue, unless they've been sick or teething or some other thing is going on. If they are healthy, meeting their growth milestones, everything else about them seems normal. They're probably just not as hungry as you're expecting them to. And like totally. that, ex the expectations and your perception of what they should be eating can really get in the way of you trusting your kid's hunger. And little kids have no reason to like, not be in tune with their hunger. They haven't learned how to do that yet. So right. like, they will it's not like me. It's like, I, I should probably fast or something like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah um, they don't have that. Like, Oh, hunger is fine. I can sit with my hunger. Right. It's like when you're feeding a baby and they eat a little bit and then they shut their mouth, they turn their face. Like they're obviously done. Right. And toddlers do the same thing. And sometimes that looks like throwing food on the floor or right like squirming in their high chair or some other manifestation of them just like being done. And I think a lot of the times we want to push through that and get them to take two more bites. Mm -hmm. and that, um, it's not usually very productive. Oh, totally. I agree 100% with everything that you just said there. And that is one of the things that I hear all the time. It's like when you're nine months old or four months old, it's all about the milk and it's all about, you have to get, certain number in per day and it's just you know everything's feeding and then they turn into this toddler that's sitting in the high chair and they won't eat and you're like well maybe if I make them peanut butter and jelly they'll eat or chicken right. nuggets or pizza or hot dogs like those are the things that people turn to because who, who doesn't like hot dogs I mean who doesn't right. like peanut butter and jelly um, but realizing that kids aren't always hungry and if you look at the way that me as a pediatrician like I see a baby they go from the hospital and I see them the next day and then I see them at two weeks and then in a month because I'm really concerned about their weight and making sure that they're gaining weight. Then it's two months and then four months and then six months and then nine and then 12 and then I don't see them for three months and then six months. So we expand that window out because we expect them, as you said, not to grow continuously, not to have the same hunger, the same growth rate that they did when they were a two month old. Right. And I think as they get a little bit older and they start, you know, if like a two-year-old is showing some signs of not being interested in food, that's also something that can trip parents up. And that can be a slightly different sure. um, developmental phase where kids are just skeptical of things that are new. And like new might be something that a kid has actually eaten in the past, but they've sort of forgotten what it tasted like. Right. And they may not want to taste it. And again, like that is a normal phase. It's called right. neophobia. It lasts usually until around six. And I have to say, so I have three kids. Only one of them is older than six. But there was mm -hmm. like a magic switch that flipped when my oldest daughter was six and a half. She suddenly like started trying things. Right. She will eat foods that are mixed together. She will eat soups. Um, I was recently having lunch with her at her school and I watched – all the kids like go through the lunch line and like none of the first graders really took any of the salad bar. A uh -huh. few of the second graders took some of it and the third graders, it was like every other one. And right. it's just like, there is a, there's a, this is a learning process. Like eating is, is learning and kids don't have memories to build on until they go through it. So right. I think that's also important to keep in mind. I think that's the case for sure too. And to realize like, one thing that I hear, and maybe you can talk about this too, because I'm sure you hear this as well, is my kid eats great at daycare and they eat terrible at dinner. 
And yeah. I, I always talk to parents about, well, one, they might just be hungry at that time of day. Two, all their friends are sitting next to them eating the green beans and the carrots and everything like that. So they're going to do that there. And if you're kind of like really tentatively like, ooh, is he going to eat that carrot? I wonder what's going to happen. And, and bringing that, that vibe with you, then um, they pick up on that. And instead of just seeing, okay, cool, everybody's eating green beans, I'll eat my green beans. Then right, they're more right. tentative and about it themselves. It, it's not like the daycare teacher is going to go make them something else. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, like if they don't eat their green beans, they just don't eat their green beans and then they like go to nap time. Like it's not, Right, exactly. Um, so I think that routine piece is really important. And so if you are in the habit of making another meal, if your kiddo doesn't eat something, like if you want them to eat the first thing that you made, you need to make that be the option. And right. I'm always recommending that um, we try to have one to two foods on the table that the kids usually like. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not like... A, that doesn't always work because sometimes kids change their minds. Right. But if you have like, you know, sliced pear or kiwi or something that they usually like and they have a little cup of milk and there's maybe some plain rice, right. that could be enough to have be a balanced dinner even if they don't eat the main dish. And um, so I'd like to sort of think about those like safety nets when it comes to family meals so that you don't feel the urge to get up and make something else because there are foods that your child will eat. Right. I think that is a good way to, um, to have a little bit of encouragement and positive affirmation that, okay, yeah, your plate has a lot of different things on it. And some of you haven't seen before, but you, you do like orange slices, we know. And right. so good job eating the orange slices. Why don't you try this now instead, or in addition to that, and then we can move forward from there. So it's not just only feeding them the foods that they like, but kind of giving them a little boost of information like you know on jeopardy you have the 100 level questions because most people get those right gives you a boost to go to the 200 level and the 400 level and whatnot and, right. and try those and be more challenged than because you've kind of got some some wins behind you that that help propel you forward yeah and i think parents sometimes underestimate the power of eating your own food and enjoying your own food in front of your kids right and um like if your kids see you eating things regularly chances are that will become normal to them and they right. will maybe someday try it. Um, it totally. depends a little bit on personality. <laughs> like, That's uh, true. like my current three-year-old wants what everybody else is eating, yeah. which is not the case with my older kiddo. So, it, you know, that can vary a little bit, but definitely like enjoy your food, expose the kids to lots of food and just know that it's normal if they don't eat it all. Um, but that's, you know, that's just part of, part of the process. Oh, totally. I think that that is one thing that parents get really hung up on and I try and help them calm down from that. We're looking at the big picture here and one bad meal or one bad week of not eating the foods does not spoil the whole trajectory of their eating because eating something that you should enjoy, um, it shouldn't be stressful and it shouldn't be something that every evening you're just avoiding or dreading dinner time. And how can I make it easier? Peanut butter and jelly, hot dog cereal it is to make it easy, but you want your kid to develop good, healthy, varied diet. Yep. And so in that regard, what do you think? So we've got some parents, they come in uh, or they send you a message or reach out because dinner time is just a nightmare and it's throwing food on the floor and screaming and stressful. And it's just like the worst hour of the day. And it's only one of three hours of the day that they get with their child because they work right. and their child's in daycare. So they have this very limited window that they want to make really special. And it's just stress, stress, stress. Where do parents start to get a handle on this? What, what suggestions do you have or what advice do you give to parents in that situation? Um, so first I would say that you, this is not just happening to you. This, yeah. is, this is the thing that most, most families deal with. Um, the end of the day can be really challenging because those kids you haven't seen, or even if you were home with them, they're probably tired. They're probably not at their, not at their best and they want to spend yeah. time with you. Um, so, so I, you know, like this will depend on what time you get home, what time bedtime is, if you like cooking. But generally speaking, I try to give the kids a small job so that they can be in the kitchen with me, feel sure. like they are important to what's happening. Right. Um, that could be like setting the table. It could be, um, 
stirring something. It could be just, so we have a learning tower, which like allows mm-hmm. a toddler to be sort of up at counter height. So right. my three-year-old will often just stand there and like look at a book or play with stickers or something just to be in the same room. Right. Um, so I would, or like put some music on and have a little dance party in the kitchen so that the kids feel like they've got some of your attention. Cause I think mm-hmm. that that's can sort of, that can make things just a little bit calmer going into it. And then with the actual food, um, don't feel the pressure to make like a four course meal or a fancy dinner right. every night of the week. Right. You can make healthy food. That's not complicated. Totally. And then try serving things family style. Um, that's something that can take a lot of the pressure away from sort of just letting the kids serve themselves. So mm-hmm. if you, if you go to a daycare, a lot of them actually let toddlers decide what they want to put on their plates. Sure. Um, And if you give your kids some of the power over what they're putting on their plates, it can make them much more excited about the meal and it can sort of neutralize those power struggles that can come up when you're trying to get them to eat certain things. So I would suggest, yeah, yeah, starting that. So if like you have taco night, just put like the stuff on the table and then everyone gets to decide what their tacos look like, whether or not that actually includes like a tortilla or like maybe right. you just wants cheese and tomatoes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and then you also don't have to get up so many times if the food is on the table, which can be really nice. That and then great. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, so Ellen Satter is a feeding therapist and researcher mm-hmm. who developed the division of responsibility, which is an approach to meal times that like delineates who's responsible for what. So the parents are responsible for, what foods are served, when they're served, um, and where they're served, and then the kids get to decide what of it to eat. And when you do it that way, it's like it's really freeing because oh, for sure, you are not responsible for making sure your kid eats five bites of broccoli. Like right, they get to make those decisions for themselves. They get to decide how hungry they are and what foods they want to eat. And especially if you've been in the habit of counting bites or like rewarding. Um, eating dinner with dessert, like it can be a really good thing to try just as far as like the stress level at the table. Oh, I agree completely. I think that is, I really like her approach too, because it just takes the pressure off you. It gives me permission to do what only I can do and my child to do what only they can do, which is choose and eat what they want um, rather than trying to force the issue or incentivize the issue. Like you said, with desserts and everything like that. Um, I think that's a really neat approach. I think it can also help, and you sort of touched on this earlier, is if you think about your child's intake, like over the course of a day or over the course of a week, like every meal may not be super balanced or exactly right. balanced, but if you look at their diet or their intake in the big picture, it probably it probably is. Because there will be yeah. days when your child wants to eat all of the blackberries. Everything, all, right. Yeah or, yeah, or everything. And then there will be days where they seem like they like literally ate nothing. Um, and so I think just sort of taking a step back with that can be really helpful too. I like that approach and, and that line of thought too, because if you look at prehistoric, you know, kids and adults and everything like that, like they didn't have an end of supply of blueberries. So they got right. blueberries sometimes and they got the nutrients that they needed from those. And then they had spinach other times of the year or, you know, figs or those sorts of things. Like they didn't have every nutrient available all the time. And so our bodies, you know, were designed to not require blueberries every week or broccoli every evening or something like that. You know, we can get the nutrients that we need to continue to grow and thrive over the course of days, over the course of a week, rather than trying to pack it all in. Every meal has to be balanced, my plate sort of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm always like reassuring people that it's the the entire year that my second child was two, like I really felt like she didn't eat dinner. Like right. this, it can go on for like kind of a long time. And if you just know that it's normal and you enjoy your food and don't let what your child is eating or not eating be the indication of whether your meal was successful, I think right. that perspective can be really helpful too. So two questions that came up as I was thinking through that and just thinking about how, what your process is like at your house and what you recommend for others. What do you do when they don't eat much and then they say at, you know, an hour and a half later that they're hungry? How do you handle that? So in our house, um, it's, you can have a banana or you can be hungry for breakfast. Okay. So I think that's totally fair. Yeah. And that, um, 
I don't really remember how exactly that started, but we've been doing it long enough that like, that's the option. There's not, it's, I mean, like, so this actually happened last night because mm -hmm. um, like we ate sort of staggered because of activities and my toddler said she was hungry and all the dinner stuff was actually still out. So I said, if sure. you're still hungry, you can eat more of what you didn't eat the first time around. Um, right. and, and then, but usually it's a banana because we always, we almost always have bananas. It's like <laughs> not a super exciting food, but my kids yeah. like, like them. If they're truly right. hungry, then that's what they'll eat. So. I think that's a good approach. We do it slightly different in our house in that we basically just, if they don't eat, you know, if there's stuff left on their plate, then we'll, we'll keep their plate and put it in the fridge. And then if they say they're hungry, we just give them their plate back. And they mm -hmm. see that, oh, this is the exact blue plate that I had at dinner. Well, okay, I guess I'll eat <laughs> some more I'm of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe I'm not that hungry after all. Right. Um, and then, okay, so that, and then desserts. Do you just um, do dirt desserts? If you're going to have a dessert at a meal, how do you work that into the equation? If they're a good eater or not a good eater, or, you know, how you would describe that? Um, so I try as hard as possible to not make dessert a reward for anything. So okay. we like we for most weeks we have ice cream on Friday and Saturday nights. Okay. And so the kids get ice cream regardless of what dinner is or regardless of whether or not they ate much dinner. And gotcha. they're always really excited about it. And um if they if they want seconds, I usually let them have, actually, I've actually started letting my seven-year-old do her first portion because, uh, okay. um, because there was a period where like they were asking for more and I was like, you know what, here's your bowl, here's the ice cream scoop, you do it. Like right. you, show me, <laughs> you show me what you think is, an, is a good amount of ice cream for you. Sure. And it actually wasn't any more than what I had given her, but since she was in charge of it, it like totally took away the asking for more. Yeah. She just seemed to satisfy that like urge to be in control of it. Um, I like and that. And then other times, like if I had to make, if I have made something like today, this morning, I shot a brownie recipe video. Mm -hmm. So I've got brownies sitting in the fridge. So in that case, I will give everybody, if they want them, which they probably will, um, <laughs> I'll just put it on their plate with dinner and then sure. they can eat it or not eat it. They can eat the rest of their food with it in any order. Um, that will, you know, and that's like a single serving and then there's no like after dinner demands for anything. They just right. get it all at once. Then you're done. Yeah. I, I like that approach because it's just so simple and it just makes it so easy. And there aren't these elaborate rules or you have to take three bites. No, you have to take right. one more bite if you want that. Just eat the broccoli so you can have your chocolate. Fine. Just have your chocolate. You did fine enough. You know, there's just none of that stuff, which you can tell. We, right. <laughs> we have not always been perfect at that at our house. If what? I mean, I've got the vocabulary for it. Right. So. It's hard because it's um, like this actually happened at our Thanksgiving dinner where friends that we had over were doing that with their daughter. And mm -hmm. I was sort of like, I mean, I didn't, it was Thanksgiving. I was not going to like have this conversation, but you know, I'm like, right. it's so arbitrary. Like right. when you're deciding how many more bites they need to take, like based on what? Like, <laughs> right. And then you're like, gosh, I wish I just said two because I, know, I said I know. four. <laughs> And they did too. And I just want this to be over with. Why did I yeah. say four and not just two? Yeah, just right. it's just very arbitrary. Like why why is that considered right. the right amount of food or the right thing? So I like how simple that is. And it's just um, irrespective of how you do with or what you eat at dinner. Right. You have dessert or you don't have dessert. And that's right. just totally fine. And I, I like that approach a lot. Um, okay. So looking back at the big picture, Parents come in and they say their child doesn't eat dinner at all. What, where do you start or how do you help them in that specific case where it's like they just don't eat dinner? What do we do? Um, so I would say, like, are they eating their other meals? Have they been teething? Because mm -hmm. that is often one. Or have they had a sure. cold? Um, and I think a lot of parents don't realize that that can throw appetite off. Sure. Um, so, and if neither of those things are happening, I would just go back to like, are there foods on the table that they usually like? Mm -hmm. Are you making the portions really small so that they're not overwhelmed by foods that they may not be comfortable with or that they may not think that they like? Like if right. you, if you're having peas and you have a child who doesn't really like peas, like give them two peas, like instead right. of, and then you're also not wasting a ton of food. And if they happen to try one, cause they can see what it is really clearly. Right. They might want more. Right. Um, 
So I would say like scale back your expectations of how much you think they need to be eating, evaluate whether they're happy and growing in the, like if, with other types of um, development. And then if you really are concerned that your child isn't eating anything or if their accepted food list is like really super short, if you've gone through the steps of you track what they've eaten for a week and they literally mm -hmm. eat three things and this is like right. their normal, then I would say you should reach out for help. Find a feeding therapist, talk to your doctor, right. Um, right. get some extra resources because there are cases where you do need additional help and you do need some perspective. I think that's the perfect approach. And I really like everything that you said there. And I think that that's what I try and impress upon parents too. And, and it's, it's looking at the big picture rather than focusing on that dinner two nights ago, that was just a meltdown and everybody was crying around the table. Like it's hard to get out of the weeds of that though. And, and look at the big picture oftentimes, but yeah. awesome. Well, um, I think that your message is great. It's simple. It's straightforward. And the food that you put on Instagram that I see is just like perfect. It looks a lot like our plates. Like it's not a lot of like elaborate casseroles or pasta dishes. It's really like this thing, this thing, this thing, and this thing, which is exactly how we do it at our house. I um, mean, it makes it just so easy, especially for leftovers and everything like that and food prep and um, just realizing that you don't have to have a ton of added ingredients or sugar or salt or those sort of things to have nutritious food that your kids will actually enjoy. So it was great to chat with you. I, I really like your message. I know that my listeners will want to find out more, follow you. And um, Yummy Toddler Food is your Instagram handle. And yummytoddlerfood.com is your, um, your website. And then you also have a podcast, which is great too. And we were talking before we started recording just about you know fellow podcasters. And I always like talking with podcasters um, because they have such good information to share. And your podcast is called Comfort Food Podcast. And yep. so that is a great resource too for parents to hear from from you and from other people in the field about all the different things that go into toddlers eating or not. Yeah. And we also on comfort food, we also talk about um, diet culture and like mm -hmm. mom, it, like food issues and just sort of a much broader perspective. So if you, um, you know, if you're like feeling challenged with your own relationship with food, or if you just want to find like-minded people who are struggling with family dinners, come, come check us out too. Yeah, it's great. And I do, I'm glad that you mentioned that too, because I have heard some of those episodes because it's a big thing. Like, I mean, we spend a lot of time eating in our lives and you spend a lot of time with your child eating. That's like one of the main activities that we do. And so having a good relationship with food is so important and having a healthy relationship and a healthy way to talk and discuss food is really critical to that good development of a good diet, good healthy lifestyle. So I really appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you and um, keep up the good work. Thanks so much.